Today I want to rant about something. This is going to be a slightly different video than usual because A, it's extremely self-indulgent for me, B, we haven't looked at a piece of media in a while, and C, almost no research went into this video. It's just my own decades-long obsession with this piece of media. Today I want to talk about fictional history, which is not historical fiction. And I think that's where I stumbled the most when I first thought of this video, because whenever I would go to actually do that research, and I would go to Google and I would type in fictional history, and historical fiction would always show up. Which, not to bash historical fiction, but that's not what I needed and is not what we are talking about today. Fictional history is a term that may or may not already exist, but it is what I am applying to this idea and it can also be called a lore, or world building, or a mythopia, or a legendarium. So what am I talking about? What do I mean when I say a fictional history? To put it very simply, I am talking about a history of a fictional world or universe. A great example would be Lord of the Rings. There is the story that is happening on the page as you're reading it, but J.R.R. Tolkien also wrote a world history and an entire linguistic tree for Middle-earth. Game of Thrones or Avatar The Last Airbender are also great examples of fictional worlds that have lengthy histories that impact the story. Sometimes the fictional history goes back thousands of years, and sometimes it's just a few centuries or even just a handful of decades. In my opinion, having a solid fictional history is a great way to make your world feel very lived in and real. It can give your larger authoritative bodies a reason for why they might act a certain way, and it can also tie very neatly into the goals and motivations of your main characters. There are other video essays on this website that talk about J.R.R. Tolkien and Avatar and Game of Thrones and how those fictional world histories work well, but today I want to talk about a series that I haven't seen in any of those video essays and why I think it also works very well. I am, of course, going to be discussing a silly shonen comic series about a kid in a straw hat who wants to become King of the Pirates. Let's talk about One Piece. On the surface, I'll admit, One Piece doesn't seem that deep. But I swear to you, its fictional history and world building are phenomenal. When it started, I don't know if the author Eiichiro Oda ever intended to get as caught up in this world that he created, but I am very grateful that we are all able to come along on this journey with him. The One Piece manga started in 1997, and it is still going, over 25 years later. Unsurprisingly, One Piece is the longest running comic series of all time. It has over 1,000 chapters, and it's getting close to 1,100 animated episodes, over a dozen movies, and yes, there is a Netflix live-action series coming out. No! Oda has revealed that we are entering the final saga of the series, and that there is only about three to five years left before the story is finished, but I would be personally very surprised if he stuck to his own timeline on this, so we will see. When I say that this series is incredibly important to me, I'm not f***ing around. <laughs> I have a straw hat permanently tattooed on my body. With that being said, is it a perfect series that always hits the mark? Absolutely not. The series has been around for almost as long as I've been alive, and when he started the series, the author was a completely different person living in a completely different world. But to fully dig into this and give you a little bit of context, the One Piece story actually starts very small. It's about a guy who sets out to become a pirate in a dinghy. He has no crew and his ship is almost immediately destroyed, but over the course of over a thousand chapters he travels the treacherous sea known as the Grand Line, gathers a crew and a larger pool of allies, and cements himself in the world as a force to be reckoned with. Now, despite the kind of cartoonish style of the drawing and the very bright colors and everything, it should be important to note that this story takes place in an absolutely brutal world. Throughout the course of the story, it explores themes of racism, genocide, eugenics, abuse, corruption, media misinformation, and much, much 
much more. This world that the plot is exploring is very new to the main characters, and by extension us as the readers, but the world feels like it's definitely been around for a long time. It has established powers of authority, cultures, economy, and ways of life. It's been around for a while, and the author lets you know that on page one. In Hello Future Me's video, World Building Fictional History, he talks about how having only one giant event happen in the past can make your world building feel static. And I 100% agree, because history is not just one big thing that happened and everything that came after it, but instead it's hundreds of things happening to millions of people everywhere, all at once, throughout time. And that is something that One Piece, for the most part, does very, very well. The history, as it is relevant to the plot of the story, extends back about a thousand years. And in that time, there are many interesting things that happen, some of which affect the characters and are more relevant to the overarching plot than others. For example, when the story starts, the Golden Age of Piracy has been happening for about two decades. On page one, we are told how it started and why it is important to the plot. Our main characters are going out into an established world, and we, the readers, get to go along with them and see how that affects different people in different places. The story of One Piece also often feels like it's history in the making. There is a narrator that very infrequently appears and is just kind of there to allude to how current conflicts will result in much bigger catastrophes or events later on. For the people who know this series well, uh, one of the bigger examples I can think of is the fight between Ace and Blackbeard. The narrator appears and says something along the lines of these events would have world-shaking consequences. And we do eventually see that tragedy play out several hundred chapters later with the outbreak of a war. A major point that I want to get across about One Piece's fictional history and why it works so well is that history, like humanity, is extremely complicated. Fictional history of One Piece is prone to the same things as real history. There are unreliable narrators, or how an event or a historical figure is interpreted can change over time. History is not static, but it is political. Some people say that history is written by the victors. I don't, though. <laughs> I think that it is far too broad and incorrect of a statement because people who lose often write things down. The people who are from a suffering nation are going to write and tell a very different story than the people who are victoriously doing the conquering. And that's where it gets complicated. As a result, how history is taught, how it is portrayed in television or museums is inherently political, especially in today's social climate of misinformation. The author of One Piece actually makes this point repeatedly throughout the series in a number of very interesting and nuanced ways. For example, there are a number of authoritative bodies in One Piece that make up the overarching political scene that are extremely crucial to the story's framework. They each have different views and different beliefs, and they each want to twist, hide, or expose the true history of the world for their own agendas. Most relevant to this conversation is the World Government, an alliance of 20 nations that keep a tentative peace between them, but they do not represent every country in the world. The World Government has a powerful force of marines that, in theory, protect these countries from pirates and other nations. At the top of the political and social hierarchy of the world government are the Celestial Dragons, the highest social class in the world. They do not interact with common people because they see themselves as gods and go so far as to wear suits that prevent them from breathing the same air as the plebeians when they occasionally venture out of their palatial city, Marijoie. They enslave and murder people on a whim, and the author wastes no time in letting you know that these people are awful. <laughs> A little bit of social commentary for you there. Within the Marines and the world government, there are a ton of people that hold a variety of different views of the world. There are Marines who have a very strong sense of duty and justice, and they want to help and protect people. But then there are also Marines who have a very warped sense of justice, and will even go so far as murdering civilians if it is deemed as necessary. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. 
The world government has actively destroyed cultural heritage in an effort to hide parts of their history, going so far as to murder an entire island of people and burning down a very rich research library. Much of their power actually comes from their abuse of history, which they use to justify the continued worship of the upper classes and to attempt to strike fear into those who might oppose them. If the truth were to be revealed, that would probably cause some issues for them, and as a result, they are using history for political reasons. So we have the world government on the board, but we also have pirates, which is the side or faction that our main characters belong to. There are a number of different types of pirates, some who hold very little power and are just kind of floating around doing what they do. But there are also extremely powerful figures like warlords and emperors who have a lot of pull in the world. Just like marines, pirates can range from small fry murderers and looters who fill in the typical bloodthirsty pirate archetype. And then there are those who are more akin to freedom seekers who are in search of emancipation or something more. In this world, pirates aren't inherently bad in the same way that the world government and marines aren't inherently good. I should also mention that somewhere between these two, there is the revolutionary army and they seek to destroy and overthrow the world government, exposing its bloody history along the way. The lack of a black and white monolith of these guys are all good and these guys are all bad in One Piece is part of why I think it's so engaging because people hold a variety of views and even if they belong to the same organization, if they all believe the same thing all the time, then that is just out of touch with reality in my opinion. If you want to see people who share the same political views absolutely tear each other apart, I suggest spending some time on the bird website or just the internet in general. <laughs> My point is, all of these groups and all of the people who make up these groups are going to interact with history and the world in very different ways. The world government is willing to commit a genocide in order to keep its history hidden, and there are some pirates and a revolutionary army that will do anything to expose it. Another way that One Piece makes a great fictional history is how it takes inspiration from real-world history. We know that the author, Eichiro Oda, is a history buff. He really, really likes history, and he has spoken a lot about his early obsession with Vikings and other time periods from around the world. I think that's also a great way for writers to make their stories more relatable. You don't need to make something up out of thin air when history in all of its messy glory is right there for you to pick ideas from. Throughout One Piece, there are a number of events that occur that are 100% inspired by real historical things that have happened. Oda has, of course, adapted and changed things so that it fits logically within the story's narrative, but the shimmer of reality is there just beneath the surface. For example, the way the pirate hierarchy works with the warlords and the emperors is extremely reminiscent of 17th and 18th century privateers in Europe. We see the destruction of the Library of Alexandria and the burning of books in Nazi Germany play out at O'Hara, a world tree filled to the brim with history books brought to ashes by the world government. We see Japan during the Edo period reflected in a country called Wano that has closed its borders and is completely cut off from the rest of the world among dozens of other examples of where Oda has taken from the rich history of the real world and adapted it for One Piece. There is also a ton of wordplay in this series, especially when it comes to character names, which in itself is very impressive because there's over a thousand named characters. For example, two of the main cast of characters have historically inspired names. Rora Noa Zoro was inspired by the bloodthirsty French pirate Francois Lolonais, and Usopp is both a Japanese pun and a play on the ancient Greek writer Aesop, who wrote the story of the boy who cried wolf. We also have X Drake, named after Sailor Francis Drake, Thatch, Edward Newgate, and Marshall D. Teach, who are all, to some degree, named after the historical pirate Blackbeard. We have Jewelry Bonnie, named after the pirate Anne Bonnie. Capone Beige, named after American gangster Al Capone. Eustace Kidd, named after Captain William Kidd. Lafite, who was named after Pirate Brothers. Jean and Pierre Lafite. Alvida, who was named after a Scandinavian princess turned pirate. And many, many, many more. We also have a ton of people named after mythological creatures and food. 
And I don't know about you, but for me, these shimmers of reality in this weird, colorful, vibrant world are part of what makes it so engaging to me. <laughs> it feels like there is almost a whole other story just beneath the surface, and I can't help but feel drawn into it. Having all of these different aspects makes a fictional world feel very relatable and lived in, and it almost feels familiar in a way because of it. One Piece has been around for a long time, and by the nature of the story of the crew skipping from one island to the next, it lends itself well to a slow expansion of this world, the people who live there, and their history. Sometimes the history is highly relevant and pertinent to the plot, and sometimes it is used to flesh out a character's backstory or a location. I just think it's really well done, and I hope that I have explained myself well and at the very least done it justice. Several months ago, I had the very lofty goal of planning to go through the entire series arc by arc and finding every historical reference in the series. And I actually wrote the first script. It was about 10 pages long, and it was just the East Blue arc. Um, and I even recorded the intro to it, but I chickened out, so you get this instead. Sorry. <laughs> if that is something that you would like to see, let me know in the comments, and if enough people show interest, maybe I'll put it on a different channel where I just do media analysis, or maybe I'll put it here. I don't know. We'll see, we'll see what the, uh, the outpouring of support is like, and if people actually want that, I guess first. <laughs> but please also let me know if there was a part of the One Piece world history that really stuck out to you when you were reading the story or watching the anime and uh, let's keep this conversation going in the comments because you know I can talk about this for a long time. <laughs> I obviously could continue talking about this for hours but I am going to call it here. Thank you for sticking around to the end of this video. I just have a friendly reminder that I do have a coffee if you want to really show your support for the channel. If not, sending this to a friend, liking it, and subscribing. I, I really appreciate that too, and I just really appreciate everyone's continued support for this channel. It genuinely means the world to me, so thank you. But wherever you are, I hope that you have a wonderful day or evening, and I will see you next time.